grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever considered what your demand to God might have been? You know, the sort of demand that we make when we need a little bit more in order to believe. In our text today, Thomas's demand was to physically see and touch Jesus. So what would your demand be? What sign would you ask God to show you that if he did, you would dedicate your life to him, that you would believe in him? Maybe it would be if you saw somebody resurrected from the dead. Maybe a loved one who's passed You wish God would bring them back to life, and then you would believe. Or maybe it's a miraculous healing of a disease. Maybe a friend or a family member or a loved one has been diagnosed with a terminal illness or been the victim of a bad accident, and if God would just miraculously heal them, then I would believe. Or maybe it's a blessing of prosperous wealth and an earthly life with all that you want. You pray to God and you ask him, I'll believe in you if you grant me the relationship of a married spouse that I want or the job that I would like or the school that I wish to get into. Now I want you to imagine whatever your demand or sign would be, imagine this, that God granted your request. No matter what it was. In fact, Not only did he grant it, but it became something that he charges his church to do as a matter of course until he returns to finish the final fulfillment of all of the salvation of God. So imagine this demand, the sign you have is done every week, in and out, every week. So maybe you picked one of the most extraordinary signs of resurrection. And you're thinking to yourself, if I see God raise somebody from the dead, that's it. I'm going to believe in him. It's over. I'm going to follow him for the rest of my life. But now imagine that that happens every time you gather on Sunday morning. And it's happened ever since the church began 2,000 years ago. Would it still be extraordinary? Would it still be the thing that you would say, wow, this must really be God? Or maybe after the hundredth time or the thousandth time or the ten thousandth time the church has done that, this extraordinary sign would start to become ordinary. It would start to become a matter of course, something you expect from God. In our gospel text Jesus appears to his disciples after his death and resurrection and gives them and the church through them an extraordinary gift. Yet the one who isn't there, Thomas, demands more from Jesus in order to believe. Just like we sometimes do. So what does Jesus do in response to this demand? Well, let's back up a bit to the beginning of this scene. Jesus' disciples, they're hiding in a locked room, the text tells us, for fear of the Jews. Because the person they put all their hope in, the Messiah, was just killed on a cross, and he's dead, and he was tried and killed as a criminal, and everyone has seen them walking around with him. So they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to be implicated with Jesus. And they were even afraid of that before he died. That's why they scattered. That's why Peter denied and Judas betrayed. But we know that Jesus, the grave, could not hold him. And so Jesus appears amongst his disciples. They're in a locked room. They're afraid. And just like Mary Magdalene, they don't recognize him right away. Which to us seems crazy. I mean, you spent a bunch of time with this guy right? But for a moment, put yourself in their shoes. They're terrified before he shows up. They are well aware of their own failures as his disciples, that they've abandoned him and scattered. 
Peter denied him. So their first thought must be, this is the vengeful spirit of Jesus, come back. Because we all abandoned him. But Jesus doesn't let them remain in that fear. In mercy, he gives them signs. He shows them his hands where the nails were driven through and his side where he was pierced by the spear. And it says in the text, only then were they glad to see the Lord. That's so amazing, isn't it? That Jesus is the one that makes the effort to assure them and bring them to peace. They don't deserve it. They scattered. They denied him. They betrayed him and abandoned him in his time of need. And like us, they don't deserve the mercy of God. And yet, in his great love, he gives it. And he says again to them, peace be with you. And imagine the sense of peace that now rests on them. Jesus, who they thought was dead, is alive. And it turns out he didn't come back to wreak a vengeance upon them, but to bring them peace, to set things right, because he was doing something even more amazing than they thought. So after he's brought them to a place of peace, they're no longer terrified, they are now comforted by the presence of God, he sends them. Even so, just as my Father sent me, even so, I am sending you. This, we could say, is the birth of the church. It's fully realized in Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles and they begin to preach. But here is the beginning. Even so, I am sending you. Now, they just were terrified, and now Jesus is sending them out. Do you think they're ready? No way. Right? They're still in a locked room, afraid of earthly battles, much less the spiritual battle that the Lord is sending them into. But then he assures them again by giving them a gift so that they're not doing this alone. Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Did you catch that? A little bit of the extraordinary mixed in with the ordinary? We'll come back to that in a moment. Because there's a problem. Uh oh. One of the disciples wasn't there. He wasn't there to see Jesus in his resurrected glory. And so what is the natural thing that would happen? To use the example I had in the children's message, what if you came in and found there was a thousand pound grizzly in the church? Would you keep that to yourself? Probably not, right? And so it says right after that, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Because once his resurrected reality is made known. You can't keep it to yourself. And Thomas, he believed their testimony and was overcome with joy, right? Oh, wait. No, nope. sorry, I skipped a part. No, that isn't what happened. His response was, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. That was Thomas's demand. Further proof. I need a further sign. I'm not going to take you at your word that Jesus has risen from the dead, that you have seen him. The Greek word here is pastuo. It's the verb to believe. It's used 248 times in the New Testament. And 239 times out of those, it means belief. So often this, this story is known as the story of doubting Thomas. Thomas is not doubting. He clearly says, I will never believe unless this demand is met. He still thinks Jesus is dead. He still believes everything is over. So, 
What does Jesus do in response to this faithless demand from his disciple who abandoned him in his time of need? In mercy, he gives Thomas everything he asks for. He appears to him and meets all his demands. Again, displaying this unbelievable love that God has for feckless and faithless people. That he goes through all the effort to reestablish himself with Thomas. Now, does that mean that whatever your demand was that you were thinking of at the beginning is going to be answered in this same way? No. This isn't a prescriptive text. It's not describing a normal interaction with God. After all, he has big plans for Thomas in the beginning of the church, and the Holy Spirit has yet to be given out as it will be for the rest of time through the church. But Jesus has established a way for his resurrected reality to be believed by you and me and all the other Christians we share faith with throughout time and space. So the answer to the question of, does this mean that Jesus will answer all of my demands for faith? Well, yes and no. Not exactly like Thomas, but Jesus has plans for his disciples and for his church so that those who hear about him may believe. And so so to understand this text's connection to us and the rest of the church, we must look at how Jesus' interaction with Thomas concludes. So after Jesus shows Thomas all his demands, he says, here, put your hand, put your finger in the mark of the nail in my hand, put your hand into my side, do not disbelieve, but believe. And what happens? Thomas confesses faith. He says, my Lord and my God. Good news. Joyous news. Thomas believes again. Yet, Jesus doesn't simply say, well done. Good job for believing me after seeing me. He says instead, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But what exactly does all that mean? Jesus knows he's going to ascend into heaven. He tells this to Mary Magdalene when she meets him in the garden, and he tells her to inform his disciples of all that he said. So the disciples, they have at least heard this. They clearly don't fully understand what it means. But Jesus knows he's going to descend and depart to a place where his disciples, his followers, His believers cannot go just yet. So Jesus can't appear to every one of his disciples who demands the sort of sign that Thomas does because he's not going to be present in that way for a period of time. So how are they going to believe? Who is he sending his disciples to and how are they going to convince people that Jesus really rose from the dead, because it didn't work for any of them. right? Not just Thomas, but all the other disciples, they had to see Jesus' hands and his side before they believed it was really him. So what hope do we have? Because he's not going to show up like that to us. So let me ask you, dear friends in Christ, a couple of questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, your Savior? Have you ever seen him like Thomas? Well, then how do you believe? As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He says to his disciples, you know and believe because Jesus sent someone to tell you about it. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was your parent. Maybe it was a friend. Or maybe it was even your child who told you that they have seen the Lord, that Jesus is alive, and because he is alive, we have hope and life eternal. In the Lutheran Church, we confess that faith is not something understood, chosen, or earned. It's, in fact, a gift from God freely given through the Holy Spirit. 
so when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, and gave them through the church the ability to forgive sins and to withhold forgiveness for the sake of repentance, he was giving them the tools to proclaim the glorious reality of his resurrected victory so that people could believe who have not seen. So this is the gift that's been given, and it's been given in two parts. First is the Holy Spirit, so that through the Holy Spirit the disciples are sent, and that's fully realized on Pentecost with the whooshing of the wind and the tongues of flame and all of that. But notice right after the Holy Spirit is given to them, Peter preaches the word, the witness of Jesus being the Messiah, and what happened? and 3,000 people came to faith. None of those people saw Jesus and touched the mark of the nails in his hands or put their hand in his side, and yet they believed this truth, that Jesus rose from the dead victorious. That's the first gift. And it's by that gift that you and I believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But the second part of this gift is that same Holy Spirit has granted the church throughout time and space the ability to speak in the stead and by the command of Jesus. Words that you hear me speak every week. For when I speak the forgiveness of sins, it is not by my authority, but by the authority given to the office within the church that Christ has allowed to speak on his behalf in his stead and by his command, so that you know that when you hear your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is true. It's not just some human named Adam Thompson telling you that. It is God himself through his church. I have very little to do with it. I'm like the the musical instrument. You don't clap and cheer for the musical instrument after a performance. You are excited and sing praises to the player. And in this case, that's Jesus Christ. So, dear friends in Christ, you have not seen Jesus, but you have believed on the account of the word about him. And our text says that blessed are you for believing without seeing. And that testimony, beginning with the apostles in that locked room, carries on until this very day and into the future. This same spirit that's been gifted is alive and well, By Christ's design, that same Spirit of God sustains us through the proclamation of forgiveness of sins granted here, and the fact that Jesus still appears among us, although not quite exactly the same, but in his body and blood in the sacrament. All for you. Isn't that amazing? You see, Jesus, with his disciples, he's the one making all the effort to bring them peace in the midst of their earthly fear and their spiritual despair. And he continues to do the very same thing today with you and me. So take heart, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for just as he did for Thomas, you have heard that we have seen the Lord, and you have believed by this extraordinary gift of the Holy Spirit granted to his apostles in our text today. And your faith in this reality has been sustained through our Lord's continual proclamation of sins forgiven and his appearance among you in merciful love. In him you do indeed, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. How do I know? Because I have seen the Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the reality of our risen Jesus and his victory over all the evil of this world until he comes again to make everything new. Amen.